Mm. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture on Latino testimonials, where we will be discussing uh, selections from the book Telling to Live. One of the authors that we are reading is Aurora Levins Morales, who's a writer, feminist, activist, born in Puerto Rico, raised in Chicago, Illinois. She identifies as Puerto Rican and Jewish. She published with her mother, Rosario Mor Morales, a collection of poems and essays called Getting Home Alive. Other publications include Remedio, Stories of Earth and Iron from the History of Puerto Ricanas, and Medicine Stories, Essays for Radicals. In the piece, Certified Organic Intellectual, her key criticism is how intellectuals have been defined within academia as knowledge producers that develop their theories from abstract knowledge. And so she defines an organic intellectual as someone who develops their theories from personal experiences, from localized knowledge, and not abstract intellectual spaces. She critiques the limits of academic knowledge and the use of abstract language. She also critiques how women's studies as a field uh, that was started with ties to political activism has bought into this kind of academic knowledge and has distanced itself from the everyday lives of women. So she identifies the importance of creating spaces where personal knowledge can be shared and validated. And this quote kind of captures um, her philosophy. The intellectual tra traditions I come from create theory out of shared lives instead of sending away for it. My thinking grew directly out of listening to my own discomforts, finding out who shared them, who validated them, and in exchanging stories about common experiences, finding patterns, systems, explanations of how and why things happened. That is the central process of consciousness raising of collective testimonial. This is how homemade theory happens. In the story, The House Mama Biela Built, Daisy Coco de Filippis describes her early years in the Dominican Republic and the various spaces in which she was exposed to different types of culture. For instance, we see the space of the park as an open space where those of the lower classes could express themselves in contrast to the school for the children of the elites. The park also served as a democratizing space where the servants and the children of the middle class like herself could coexist. We also see the significance of generational storytelling through the role of her grandmother who took it upon herself to ensure that young Daisy learned about the history and culture of the Dominican Republic. We also see how space was used by the grandmother to share local history, inspired by street, street signs, for example, to tell the stories of some of the prominent leaders in Dominican history. And in this quote, you see her say, the house Mama Biela built for me is one I can take with me wherever I go, for it is made of memories and an understanding of who I am. In the next piece, also by Aurora Levins Morales, my name is the story. She shares her own story of migration and how distinct it is from the quote unquote typical story of Puerto Rican migration. She, she um, challenges those who would ascribe to a particular authentic definition of what it means to be Puerto Rican. She discusses how her racial and class identity are perceived differently depending on where she is, Chicago or Puerto Rico. Her gendered experience as a teenage girl in Puerto Rico, where other teenage girls were becoming pregnant, uh, influences the parents' decisions to move to Chicago. So she also um, details how uh, gender impacts migration. Um, in her case, to be Puerto Rican means to come from a political Marxist communist family who suffered because of their leftist politics in the 1950s, and means also growing up with a feminist consciousness, mo consciousness modeled by her mother and by engaging in early feminist groups and conversations. As a Puerto Rican Jew, it also means being Jewish and acknowledges the historical connections between Jews and Puerto Ricans, particularly in New York City from the 1930s to the 1950s. So she ex expanding what uh, community means to her. Because of the uniqueness of her experiences, she expands uh, community uh, to mean that um, she's not just Puerto Rican and not only Puerto Ricans are members of her community, but that her community is also made up of Puerto Ricans um, 
um, sorry, she, uh, she, her community also, it means um, including people that are not just based on sharing culture or sharing an ethnicity, but also is based on solidarity and sharing in political views. This allows her to be able to be both affirming and critical of Puerto Rican culture. As she explains, this is one Puerto Rican reality that it has been not in nationalist self-affirmation, but in the critiques of feminist women of color of their own cultures that I have found the space as a Puerto Rican woman to speak most truthfully about my real experiences, not the ones I was supposed to be having as US Puerto Rican. So this piece really um, speaks to the many uh, Latinas who uh, might not fit um, into the Latino community because of their different experiences, because they might not speak Spanish, because maybe they didn't grow up in a environment with a lot of other Latinos, um, and or because they're middle class. Um, so it really speaks to the fact that there isn't any one way of being Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican or Latinx, but that there's multiple ways of uh, being Latinx and that it all depends on the other experiences that you have had. In the piece, Esta Risa No Es De Loca, uh, Carita Sousa describes the various identity issues she's had to deal with and how she was always made to feel like she was quote unquote crazy because of how certain identities were imposed on her from the outside and how these did not fit her own personal perspective on her ad identities. Within her family, the West African parts of her identity from her father's side of the family are othered by the grandmother's favoring of her light-skinned grandchildren. When her family moves to Puerto Rico, there she's perceived as a gringa and not as Puerto Rican by her island peers, which contrasted with her understanding of gringos being white Americans. When she returns to New York and finds herself in a more diverse Latinx neighborhood, she learns of the hierarchy among various Latinx groups and how Puerto Ricans are at the bottom of this hierarchy. She experiences being treated as suspect by the parents of her Latino friends. After her parents' divorce, her family finds itself in poverty and dependent on welfare. This marks her and her mother within the narrative of the welfare queen, which was a narrative where single mothers on welfare were demonized by the media and politicians as being sexually promiscuous women who had multiple children just to get more money from welfare. The stereotypical construction of Puerto Rican single-headed household and poor as whore constructed a racialized sexual identity where she was automatically read as a body that was not only available for male ple pleasure and abuse, but that she welcomed that type of behavior from men. The combination of all of these identities were thrust upon her and have a significant impact on her life. As she explains, in the world I was born into, I used to feel like I was crazy. These days I've learned that what is crazy is a world that is so structured by inequality and injustice that it doesn't nurture poor Puerto Rican girls simply because they are poor Puerto Rican girls. So this quote points to the impact that being othered based on race, class, and gender have on one's mental health and well-being. She'd internalized the otherness feeling like she was the one that was crazy. Yet here she's able to heal when she realizes that there's nothing wrong with her, but that instead it's society that is broken. In the next piece by Norma Cantu, <clears throat> where she talks about being a teacher and a writer, she traces her own journey of developing her various identities. She calls herself Chicana as a way to affiliate herself with the Mexican-American and Chicana leftist politics. This was inspired as a response to the person who introduced her at an event as Spanish, thinking that calling her Mexican would be offensive. She becomes a feminist as she is exposed to feminist literature and realizes that the kind of sexist behavior she'd experienced and witnessed and knew was wrong, was indeed wrong. Feminist literature gave her the language and the courage to name it. She also was inspired to learn about the history of Chicana women who have also been feminists. What this piece adds is her claiming her professional identities as a teacher and writer as meaningful parts of who she is. She talks about being a teacher from a very young age before she was even credentialed to be a teacher or a professor. She also discusses being a writer as the thing she did, quote unquote, escondidas in hiding. Finally, she talks about birthing the self, 
and how part of that process is acknowledging the women in her family who also served as teachers to her and were influential in shaping who she would become. The last couple of pieces are written, are written by um, Cuban American writers. And Eliana Rivero's piece, uh, she talks about the privileged privilege life she had in Cuba and how this changes after she migrates to Miami following the uh, Cuban revolution. This was a common experience for the first wave of immigrants uh, from Cuba, from Cuba, sorry. Um, and so I wanted to give you a little bit of background information, historical information on Cuban migration, particularly during this time period to sort of provide a context for um, these pieces that you're reading. So the population of the first wave came as a direct result of the takeover of Fidel Castro in the island. Uh, the first to leave were professionals and politicians who had gained from the previous regime, which favored the interests of Americans and the wealthy. Many of these already had significant wealth accumulated outside of the island and thought they had enough money to write out Castro's uprising. This class was very familiar with Miami and the United States and was in many respects Americanized. They vacationed in Miami Beach and sent their children to American universities. Their children were taught English in their private schools. Cubans who left identified themselves as political exiles, not immigrants, because they believed that they would be in the U.S. for only a short while, that eventually the Castro regime will be um, plummeted and that they will be able to return. So they didn't think of themselves, themselves as immigrants as many other Latin, uh, Latino immigrant groups do. Uh, Cubans left with tourist visas or student visas when they had visas at all. Castro knew that these people were leaving never to return, but he didn't mind because he wanted the, what he called the quote unquote gusanos or worms, those that he considered anti-revolutionary out of the country since they, since they could potentially undermine his efforts. The reading also all points to the kind of financial assistance that these Cuban early uh, Cuban exiles uh, received. Um, in 1968, President Kennedy created the Cuban Refugee Program, which provided funds not just for resettlement in the United States, but also for relief checks, health, education, and job training. Uh, they received more in their relief checks than local people did. Federal funding also went to programs to expedite the licensure of Cuban professionals so that they could practice medicine law or work as teachers in the United States. Low interest loans were also made available for college. By 1966, the program had assisted more than 5,500 students. The University of Miami and the University of Florida created in 1973 intensive 18-month programs that assisted Cuban law lawyers in achieving American law degrees. And the reason for providing all of this financial assistance was because they had uh, fled uh, communism, uh, but also because the US administration thought that these folks would only be here temporarily as soon as they succeeded in ousting Castro, Cubans were going to return. So there was a sense of let's help them out while they're here. Um, it's not gonna be for very long um, and then they will return. But as we know, that did not turn out to be the case. And for decades now, Cuban um, exiles have been coming to the United States, fleeing the Castro regime and eventually fleeing poverty. So in her piece, Eliana Rivero, talks about how she was supportive of the revolution while her parents were concerned of her involvement in leftist politics. Because she came from a privileged family, her revolutionary peers, however, rejected her from participating in leftist organizing. Once in Miami, she finds herself relying on welfare and living in poverty, no longer the daughter of a privileged family. So she goes through a very sort of intense um, class identity shift. She also experiences discrimination for the first time. As a Cuban woman living um, among Chicanos in Arizona, which is where eventually she settles um, and becomes a professor, um, where of course here then in Arizona, the reference point in terms of ident identity is the border. She develops her own relationship to the border that she calls Fronterisleña, Fronterisleña a border islander. The last piece point of departure uh, represents uh, children that are coming from Cuba on their own 
um, to settle in the United States with any relatives they might have here. And again, it was a way for Cuban families um, in Cuba to try to protect their children. And so there was this uh, program created called Operation uh, Pedro Pan, Peter Pan, which was an underground program to get children from Cuba uh, to leave Cuba because of the fear of the kind of indoctrination their children would go through. So in this last piece, Mirta Quintanales portrays two children who travel on their own from Cuba to the United States. Um, so in this program, um, it was assumed um, <clears throat> that parents will reunite with them very shortly after. That often did not happen. Um, and in some cases, it would be years before the children would be reunited with their parents. As I mentioned, parents were protecting their children from communist indoctrination in schools and from military service. The majority of the children that were sent were boys ages 13 to 17. Approximately 14,000 children were part of this process. Some children were brought and ended up in foster homes because they didn't have relatives in the United States. Uh, those in Cuba who worked to get those children out of the country eventually served a significant terms in Cuban prisons when they were caught for their quote unquote counter revolutionary activities. The federal government in the United States eventually made itself economically responsible for the children, providing funds and programs uh, to help the children find foster homes, for example, learn English, get counseling to cope with psychological trauma of leaving parents behind. There have been reports of inadequate accommodations, including experiencing physical and emotional abuse, including in some places being punished for not speaking English. So there's this subset within the larger Cuban right, immigrant population of these particular children that had a very unique and, and, and particular experience. Um, and so they have a very unique story from the larger, broader um, story of Cuban um, migration. So in this uh, story, uh, Quintanales highlights the experiences of two, two children who leave Cuba by themselves to travel to Miami, where they are to leave with relatives with the hope that their parents will be able to join them soon after. While she doesn't explicitly claim these uh, children's journey to be part of Peter Pan operation, the story does capture many of the same experiences of the children that arrived through that program. We see how Caridad's role as the oldest girl places her in the role of mother, to her younger brother. She also uses the cultural gender dynamic she's familiar with when dealing with the miliciano that is going through her clothes and the suitcase. We also see her being strategic in order to hold on to her father's fountain pen. Once in Miami, we see the divisions within the family, but now that's the family that's already um, settled and migrated in Miami. Um, and we see some of the divisions within that family um, that are ready and willing to embrace an American identity and those like her aunt who are still resistant to becoming assimilated. So it's a very good story um, to depict all these different elements of uh, Cuban migration during this earlier time period, um, but also the kind of impact it has um, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, um, but also how the politics right, um, are not all the same even within one family. Uh, where the uncle, the uncle is more like, we're here in America, let's become Americanized, let's embrace where we are, and the aunt is much more resistant to that. So these pieces really, um, as testimonials, are testifying to or bearing witness to uh, a number of things, right? Their uh, individual um, identity experiences, um, experiences of migration, um, expanding and complicated what identity means, not just how you see yourself, how others see you, as uh, we saw in Carida Souza's piece, how that impacts your mental well being, um, and how we see a number of them sort of going through a process, right? Going through a journey of uh, developing their multiple identities. So, this brings our lecture for this week to an end. I will see you guys in the discussion post. Have a good week.